Hey dads, this one's for you. That's right, today we are gonna to be celebrating all the amazing fathers out there with a special look at pop culture patriarchs. And to start, well, here's some Pixar dads that we can all look up to. Storms, waves taller than the Pescaria. Wow. Hey, try that. Oh. Huh. Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Pixar dads of all time. Uh, Dad, you can let go now. Sorry. Now go have an adventure. For this list, we'll be looking at the best Pixar dads from feature-length films. This means we won't be including any Pixar shorts. Ah. There you go. You might also see a few characters on our list who aren't biological dads, but who embody some great overall dad energy. Number 10, Wilden Lightfoot, Onward. Although Ian and Barley's dad passed away when they were young, we do get to see a bit of his personality throughout the film as they strive to bring him back. That's right, Dad. It's me, Barley. When things go wrong along the way, as they always do, it's Wilden, or rather his legs, who initiates an impromptu dance party. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not really a big dancer. Uh... <laughs> Just imagine what the top half of this dance looks like. Of course, the whole conclusion of this movie is about Barley taking up the role of a dad for Ian, so we can't forget to mention him if we're counting off Pixar dads. I had someone who looked out for me. Someone who pushed me to be more than I ever thought I could be. I never had a dad, but I always had you. He's definitely a little rough around the edges, but Barley fills in the role as well as he can and manages to give Ian all the memories he would have made with his dad. He's very proud of the person you grew up to be. Well, I owe an awful lot of that to you. Number nine, Django, Ratatouille. Django is a character with a lot of world experience. He's been around long enough to know that if you don't fight for yourself, no one else will. We must live carefully. We look out for our own kind, Remy. When all is said and done, we're all we've got. He does what he has to in order to get his family fed even if that means resorting to less than honest means. Don't you feel better, Remy? Huh? You've helped a noble cause. Noble? We're, we're thieves, Dad. And what we're stealing is, let's face it, garbage. It isn't stealing if no one wants it. It's difficult to blame Django for his overly practical, if not pessimistic outlook on life. But where he really shines is when his son needs him the most. Dad, I... I don't know what to say. I was wrong about your friend and about you. By the end of the movie, Django saves Remy and wrangles the rest of the clan to help save Gusto's restaurant. We're not cooks, but we are family. You tell us what to do and we'll get it done. Number eight, Jin Lee, Turning Red. Turning Red focused a lot on mothers and the female lineage of May's family, but it's impossible to deny how pivotal her dad's role is in her life. Sleep tight. Red is a lucky color. Where Ming is definitely more high-strung, Jin is quieter and more sympathetic. He's honest with Mei when she has questions her mom won't answer, and he encourages her to keep the sillier sides of herself alive. Make room for it. L live with it. Mei, erase it if you want, but this side of you made me laugh. Mei is at a time in her life where she could use more support than condemnation, and her dad is there to supply this. His personality also shines through in little details animated into the film, which are really adorable. Dad! You know it's us, yeah. Number seven, Sully, Monsters, Inc. Okay, so while Sully isn't technically a dad, 
His dad energy is just immaculate. Oh, but I'm so glad you're safe. Oh, my, what an affectionate father. Uh, uh, actually, she's my, uh, my cousin's sister. Okay, Sully, that's okay. enough. Let's go. Sully and Mike essentially become babysitters in this movie, which is pretty hysterical. I can still hear her little voice. Hey, I can hear it too. How many kids you got in there? The way they desperately try to keep a hold on Boo is painfully relatable for so many parents. And Sully is especially put through the ringer on more than one occasion. Hey, Sully, I am bearing my soul here. The least you can do is pay attention. Oh. <sighs> hey, look at that. It's Randall. It's... Oh. He becomes sort of a surrogate father to her over the course of the film. And a pretty good one, if we do say so which makes their tearful goodbye all the more heartbreaking. Goodbye, Boo. Kitty. Kitty has to go. Number six, King Fergus, Brave. So yeah, King Fergus can be a little oblivious and maybe also a little lost in some matters, but he's also very evidently a family man. When something's troubling you. I blame you. Stubbornness. It's entirely from your side of the family. <laughs> I take it the talk didn't go too well then. I don't know what to do. Speak to her, dear. While he doesn't understand his wife's obsession with turning Merida into a perfect princess, he does seem to understand his daughter. I climbed the crone's tooth and drank from the fire falls. Fire falls? They say only the ancient kings were brave enough to drink the fire. <laughs> He's seen encouraging her to fight and be the person she wants to be, despite her mother's qualms about it. Mom, it's just my bow. A princess should not have weapons, in my opinion. Leave her be. Princess or not, learning to fight is essential. It's obvious he gets along well with his kids, and we have no doubt he's a great father through and through. Still, it would be good if he noticed when his wife and three sons turned into bears every now and again. Murder! I'll not let you kill my mother. <laughs> Boys. Number five, Carl Fredrickson, up. Even though Carl and Ellie never had kids of their own, it's pretty safe to say that as Up progresses, Carl becomes a surrogate parent to Russell. Sorry about your house, Mr. Fredrickson. You know, it's just a house. At the very least, he becomes a dog dad to Doug. Try saying that five times fast. In Doug Days, the new Disney Plus spin-off series, we get to see even more of these three and Carl radiating peak dad vibes. You are my pet, but you are also my best friend. You're a good boy, Doug. We're not sure if anything will ever beat the end of the film, though, when Carl awards Russell with the highest honor he can bestow, the Ellie Badge. I would like to award you the highest honor I can bestow, the Ellie Badge. Look how happy they both are. Number four, Hector Rivera, Coco. Not only was he straight up murdered, even after he's dead, this man can't catch a break. You took everything away from me! <laughs> you rats! Have him taken care of. He, he's not well. I just wanted to go back home! Because he passed away when Coco was still so young, her memory of him is fading which means he's also fading from the land of the dead. While Hector didn't have much of a chance to be a father to Coco, circumstances seem to give him sort of a second chance when he meets his great-great-grandson. I wish I could apologize. I wish I could tell her that her papa was trying to come home, that he loved her so much. My Coco. By the time Miguel has to leave, it's clear Hector has grown fond of him. We have no doubt he would have been an amazing father to Coco. <laughs> Coco! When I opened my mouth, what came out was a song, and you knew every word. We also can't forget about Miguel's father, who, despite his small role, is obviously a dedicated family man. You are a Rivera, and a Rivera is... 
A shoemaker, through and through. That's my boy! <laughs> Number three, Massimo Marcovaldo, Luca. When we're first introduced to Julia's father, he's an intense, stoic fisherman with a bloodlust for sea monsters. Unfortunately for Luca and Alberto, they are said sea monsters. Everyone in Portarosa pretends to believe in sea monsters. <gasps> well, I'm not pretending. <laughs> Still, even from this rocky start, we see the kind of person Massimo is. He gives the boys paid work, a place to stay, and warm meals without even knowing them. Can this face lose? <sighs> You want to work? I'll put you to work. Really? <laughs> oh, grazie, papa. By the end of the movie, any discrimination he had towards sea creatures is entirely dissolved, and he pretty much adopts Alberto as one of his own while Julia and Luca are away at school. Massimo asked if I wanted to stick around. Move in, maybe? And I just thought, ah, I think he needs me. <laughs> you know. When you think about Alberto's experience with his own absent father, the sweet moment in Ciao Alberto, where Alberto calls Massimo dad, is all the more heartwarming. Alberto. Just let me go, dad! Number 2. Bob Parr, The Incredibles franchise. He's Mr. Incredible himself. It only makes sense that he would rank so high on our list. Just don't ask him to do math. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it. This I don't way. know that way. Why would they change math? Uh, math is math. So not only is Bob Parr a superhero to Metroville, he's also a super dad. While the first movie sees more of Helen's relationship with her children, the sequel is all about Bob trying to hold down the house and kids. I'm processing. I'm doing the math. I'm fixing the boyfriend and keeping the baby from turning into a flaming monster. How do I do it? By rolling with the punches, baby! He tries to help Violet through heartbreak and dash with his math homework. All the while, Jack-Jack's powers are uncontrollable. Obviously, I can't keep giving him cookies. Uh-uh. But if I stop... <laughs> Nobody Yep, he's definitely an incredible dad. Be honest, you were waiting for that pun. They're only dropping us off at the theater. They have other things to do. So you guys are close, I guess. Yeah, I guess. We can get closer. <laughs> Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Bill Anderson, Inside Out. No one is good enough for his little girl. I know what you're doing here, Jordan. You don't think that I know what you know, but I know, you little punk. He's not good enough for Riley. No one is! Go back to jail! What are you looking for, Jordan? Something to steal? Like our daughter. Henry, the good dinosaur. The embodiment of tough love. I just wanted you to get through your fear. I know you have it in you. But I'm not like you. You're me and more. I think we went far enough today. Storm's getting worse. Let's get you home. Dory's dad, Finding Dory. He and Dory's mom never stopped looking for their daughter. You found us! That's right! You found us! Honey, honey, why do you think we stayed put here all these years? Because we believed one day you'd find us again! Exactly! But... I thought you were gone. How did we you... We went into quarantine to look for you, but you weren't there. Yeah, and we knew you must have gotten out through through the pipes. Through the pipes? That's right, sweetie, so, and so we did too. And we stayed in this spot for you ever since. Because, because we thought you might come back. Bonnie's dad, Toy Story 4. We don't get to see much of him, but we just know he's great. That's my big girl. Come on, we gotta hurry, okay? Don't forget your backpack. You're gonna have so much fun. Joe's dad, Soul. The kind of memories we cherish. Number one, Marlin, Finding Nemo. So yeah, Marlin pretty easily ranks up there as a top tier dad. He's not a perfect parent. Which parent is? 
but he's always trying his best. Are you woozy? Oh. How many stripes do I have? I'm fine. Answer the stripe question. Three. No! See, something's wrong with you. I have one, two, three. That's all I have? Oh, you're okay. How's the lucky fin? Lucky. Let's see. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go to school this year? Because there's no problem if you don't. You can wait five or six years. Come on, Dad. It's time for school. Uh uh, uh, uh. Forgot to brush. Oh. Do you want this anemone to sting you? Yes. Brush. <sighs> okay, I'm done. Up, oh, you missed a spot. Where? There. <laughs> <laughs> After what happened to his wife and the rest of his family, can you blame him for being a smidge overprotective of his only son? Daddy's got you. I promise I will never let anything happen to you. Nemo. And when said only son goes missing? Well, you better believe Marlin would travel to the ends of the ocean to find his kid. And that's exactly what he does. What was his name? Uh, some sort of sport fish or something. Tuna? Uh, trout? Marlin? That's it! Marlin! The little clownfish from the reef! It's my dad! He took on a shark! I heard he took on three. Three? Three! Three, three sharks? There's gonna be 4,800 teeth! You see, kid, after you were taken by Diver Dan over there, your dad followed the boat you were on like a maniac. Really? He's swimming and he's swimming and he's giving it all his gold. And then three gigantic sharks capture him and he blows him up. And then dive starts its feet where he gets chased by a monster with huge teeth. He ties the steam with a rock. Once he get for a reward, he gets to battle an entire jellyfish forest. But now he's riding with a bunch of sea turtles on the East Australian current, and the word is he's headed this way right now to Sydney. Wow. Oh, what a good <laughs> He was looking for you after all, shark bait. Marlin is way out of his comfort zone the entire movie, but he stops at nothing until he finds Nemo. <gasps> Nemo! You might even say he's marlin or fish-tastic, or extra-oceanary, sensational even. We'll be here all night, folks. Okay, let's keep the dad vibes going as we take a look now at the best paternity plot twists in cinema history. I guess you can say these movies took the phrase, who's your daddy, to a whole new level. Papa. Mama Coco. Is your papa Ernesto de la Cruz? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 father reveals in movies. Let him go. Boy, he is my son. Oh. Look, you're not gonna be picking a fight, Dad. Dad, Dad, Daddy O. I never thought my dad would be my best friend. For this list, we'll be looking at the best paternity plot twists in cinema history. Since some of these dad reveals are dropped at huge moments, a spoiler warning is in effect. Which of these dads would you get a Father's Day gift for? Number 10. Freddy Krueger Had a Child Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare In the sixth Nightmare on Elm Street film, Dr. Maggie Burroughs tries to help the kids who are being terrorized by Freddy Krueger. During her investigation, she realizes the terrifying villain has a daughter. This is where they took away his child. What child? Taken away, put in the town orphanage. Freddy had a kid. A series of hints make Maggie question if her birth father might just be Freddy. After looking at her suspiciously blank adoption papers, she has an inventive and terrifying nightmare. Freddy suddenly appears and reveals that he's indeed her dad. And you're mine. But you can't be my father. They took you away from me, but I made them pay. Finding out that this unforgivable villain fathered a child was a crazy and interesting twist at this point in the series. Fortunately, Maggie wasn't eager to follow in her father's footsteps and made sure he never haunted anyone again. Happy Father's Day. Number 9. The missing pilot is Professor Callahan's daughter, Big Hero 6. Hero watches a video where a failed experiment with transportation technology causes a pilot named Abigail to disappear. Field breach, abort! We've lost all contact with the pod! Oh no. It's breaking up! The pilot is gone. Portal 2 is down. He immediately assumes that the masked villain, who has been trying to steal the transportation tech, is the businessman who created it, Alastair Cray. But Hero soon discovers that his brother's old professor, named Robert Callahan, is under the mask. 
The mystery of why an educator would steal tech becomes clear when we see another video. It's revealed that the pilot that went missing was Callahan's daughter. The pilot was Callahan's daughter. Callahan blames Cray. This is a revenge story. While this fantastic twist turned the movie on its head, it also made the villainous Callahan more sympathetic. Your daughter, that, that was an accident. I no! Oh! You knew it was unsafe. My daughter is gone because of your arrogance. Number eight, a butler gets billions from his long lost father, Mr. Deeds. When a rich man named Preston Blake suddenly passes away, his long lost nephew, Longfellow Deeds, inherits lots of money. The Blake Media Company and a full staff. One of the people that used to serve the deceased billionaire was an orphaned butler named Emilio Lopez. Not only was he loyal to Blake for three decades, but they had a close father-son relationship. I bet you miss him too. I do. He was like a parent to me. You see, I never knew my father. Their bond comes back when Blake Media is in danger of being dissolved at the end of the movie. A reporter named Babe suddenly reveals that Emilio Lopez was the secret son of Preston Blake. A simple DNA test will show that Emilio Lopez is the majority stockholder to Blake Media. He's in my money! That's no money! The former butler celebrates the news of his sudden inheritance by saving the company. This last minute paternity reveal gave this Sandler comedy a happy ending. I will do good things, good things for everyone! Number seven, Star-Lord is saved by his dad. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 One of the biggest mysteries of the first Guardians film was the identity of Peter's father. Your mother was of Earth. Your father, well, he's something very ancient we've never seen here before. We finally get an answer at the beginning of the sequel. When the Guardians are taking fire from a barrage of ships, they're suddenly saved by a mysterious man. A few scenes later, the being who saved the heroes reveals he's named Ego and that he's Peter's father. I can explain your very special heritage. Finally get to be the father I've always wanted to be. Knowing that the physically ordinary Star-Lord was related to an insanely powerful character was a nice twist. Audiences were immediately invested in why such a strong being like Ego would need Peter, and why he would appear now. By revealing Star-Lord's father so early on, the movie kicked off a great mystery that we couldn't wait to dive into. I knew you must be the son of the woman I loved. If you loved her, why did you leave her? Number six, Marty runs into his pop in the past. Back to the Future. This has gotta be a dream. After Marty McFly unintentionally travels 30 years into the past, he tries to get his bearings at a diner. Just as he takes a seat next to another customer, he hears someone call out his last name. Hey McFly! What do you think you're doing? Hey, I'm talking to you, McFly! A confused Marty quickly realizes that he's sitting next to his father, George McFly. This leads to one of the most hilarious sequences in the film. Instead of crying out to his father immediately, Marty is rendered speechless and stares blankly until George gets annoyed and calls him out. What? You're George McFly. Yeah, who are you? Unlike many other reveals, the dad has no clue he's talking to his son. It's hilarious to watch Marty try not to let the truth slip while he's stuck in the past. Number five, Wesley was trained to take out his own father, Wanted. The life of a normal office worker named Wesley is forever changed when he learns that his father was assassinated by a man named Cross. My father was one of the greatest assassins who ever lived. The man who killed him is behind you. <laughs> Wesley agrees to train as a deadly assassin to help avenge his dad. After he gains some serious skills, he finally confronts and shoots Cross. Just before the villain takes his last breath, he reveals that he's Wesley's actual father. This horrifying truth is confirmed by a woman named Fox. Is it true? Yes. Why did you make me do this? Knowing that Cross wouldn't kill his own child, Wesley was trained specifically to take the assassin down. This tragic turn of events completely changed our notion of who the heroes and villains of the movie are. It also pushes Wesley to get revenge for his father in the final act. To your father, protecting you was worth giving up his life. Protect me. Number four, Il Duce fathered the saints, the Boondock Saints. Hey! 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 
Keep the faith, man. Twin brothers Connor and Murphy become local heroes after they start targeting criminals. After they get on the wrong side of a crime family, a hitman named Il Duce is sent after the siblings. The brothers barely survived the first encounter with this formidable assassin. But when Il Duce sees them again, Connor and Murphy are praying for a recently deceased friend. The hitman surprises them by finishing their prayer and revealing that he is their long lost father. In only part, we fill his spirit this late game reveal instantly ends the bad blood between the two sides. And thanks to this sudden twist, we get to see the brothers and Il Duce deliver some awesome vigilante justice together. And teeming with soul shall it ever be. In nomine patri. It feel it. Spirit of Sante. Number 3. Barbosa left his daughter Karina behind. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. It was left to me by my father. He believed I could find what no man has ever found. I will not let him down. A young Karina was left at an orphanage with Galileo's diary in her possession. She carried this special book on her journey across the seas to find the trident of Poseidon. Shortly after Karina meets the legendary pirate Barbosa, he appears to recognize the book. After stepping away from her, he quietly confirms that he's her true father. Place the infant in an orphanage, never to see her again. I thought the ruby might afford her some ease in life, but I never imagined she'd take those scribblings and make a life of her own. Life that's led her back to me. The reveal that Barbosa left Karina behind because he thought a pirate would be a bad father adds a sad and complex layer to this character. Who am I to you? Treasure. Their relationship comes to a tragic end when he sacrifices himself to save his daughter just as she learns the truth. Karina later honors her father's last act by taking on his last name. Barbosa. My name is Barbosa. Number two, Miguel is related to Hector. Coco. I can help you, you can help me. We can help each other, but most importantly, you can help me. Miguel! I'm Hector. Uh, that's nice. Yeah. Shortly after arriving in the land of the dead, the young Miguel realizes he needs to find his great-great-grandfather, Ernesto de la Cruz. At the same time, a deceased man named Hector needs someone in the living world to remember him so he doesn't disappear. He makes an alliance with Miguel to help find his great-great-grandfather. The two adventure together before realizing the shocking truth. Hector is the long-lost father of Miguel's great-grandmother Coco. That's my mama Coco. That's my mama Imelda. Is that you? Seeing these two guys realize they're related leads to one of the most emotional scenes in any Pixar film. Not only did Miguel find the relative he was truly looking for, but Hector found someone who will never forget him. I'm proud to be his family! I'm proud to be his family! Before our top dad makes a shocking reveal, here are a few honorable mentions. Lewis finds out he'll be a father in the future. Meet the Robinsons. He discovers the boy he time traveled with was his son all along. Are you saying that I'm Wilbur's dad? Oh, give the boy a prize. Aladdin discovers his father is alive. Aladdin and the King of Thieves. The head of the 40 thieves is the dad he thought was lost. My father? Father is alive? Magneto is Quicksilver's mysterious dad, X Men Apocalypse. After being heavily hinted in Days of Future Past, it was confirmed in the sequel. He's my father. What? Him and my mom, they did. No, I know. What? Are you sure? The new mutant Laura is Wolverine's daughter, Logan. She was secretly created from his DNA. What is she? She's your daughter, Logan. Alkali has your genetic code. Not just mine. Number one, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Your destiny lies with me, Skywalker. Obi-Wan knew this to be true. There's no paternity reveal more legendary than that of Darth Vader in The Empire Strikes Back. After Luke fails to defeat the villain, he angrily screams at the Sith Lord for striking his father down. Darth Vader decides this is the perfect time to tell the young Jedi who his dad really is. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. Oh. 
The twist has stunned generations of Star Wars fans, and it was so important to the filmmakers that most of the cast didn't even know until they saw the film themselves. Vader's revelation is so iconic in pop culture that it's been parodied in everything from TV shows to Toy Story 2. I'll never give in. You killed my father! No, Buzz. I am your father. No! No matter how many times we see this moment, it will never stop being a fantastic reveal. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. No! No! The dad joke. Yes, the Merriam-Webster dictionary describes it as a wholesome joke, usually told by fathers, with a punchline that is often obvious or predictable. I describe them as being absolutely cringeworthy, and yet I love them. So here now are some of the most mortifying dad jokes you can find in the movies. FBI, female body inspector. You know, because we're both in law enforcement, uh, we both like women. But hey, I got a weird sense of humor. I'm a, I'm a sick puppy. I can't look at it. It makes me laugh so. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Real nice, you know, it's all class. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 cringeworthy movie dad jokes of all time. Here I am, Fuzzy Bear, to tell you jokes both old and rare. Watcha, watcha, watcha. Ah. <laughs> hey, let's start things off with a bang. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Watcha, 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 watcha. This guy's lost. Your Honor. The defense rests. Then there's nothing left for me to do but make my judgment. And in my judgment, any folks who would sleep through a trial like this are folks who don't deserve to have a wonderful upstanding son like North. Don't be frightened, young man. My bark is worse than my bite. Say something. What do you say to a tree? Anything you want. For this list, we're looking at the cheekiest and most forced form of joke telling cinema has to offer. The characters in question don't necessarily need to be dads per se, or even men, but their sense of humor has to fall in line with what dad jokes are generally perceived to be. Also, we're not saying these movies are bad for telling these jokes, just that these characters might need some new material. Actually, on second thought, never change. <laughs> What's your favorite movie dad joke? Once upon a time. There was a magical place where it never rained. The end. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> I never get anything he says. Number 20, Winged, Flash Gordon. Ah, uh, what is a dad joke without a good pun? As Flash leads the Hawkmen in their siege on Mingo City, they're met with more than a little resistance. Several Hawkmen are shot out of the sky, and Flash goes to tend to one who may be severely wounded, though the Hawkman soon puts his fears to rest. Hero! You all right? They just winged me! Such an ace of mine! Right! We sincerely doubt he'd have made the same comment if he'd been shot in the leg. Number 19, Running Out of Ink, Iron Man 2. Yeah! What I'm talking about. Thanks for coming. Justin Hammer so wants to be Tony Stark, but he just doesn't have the same level of rapid-fire quips. As if his entrance to the expo stage wasn't cringy enough, he doubles down on his confidence with a quip of his own. Well, today, my friends, the press is faced with quite a different problem. They are about to run out of ink. Get that out. <clears throat> If his cadence didn't imply he was telling a joke, we probably wouldn't have even realized it. Yeah, get that podium away from him. He doesn't deserve it. Number 18, electric fence joke, Jurassic Park. Now this is just mean. 
Dr. Grant finds himself looking after siblings Lex and Tim after the park's security starts to go haywire with dinosaurs running amok. Greeted with an electric fence he's pretty sure is powered down, Grant sees an opportunity to lift the kid's spirits. That's not funny. <laughs> that was great. Well, maybe we can... We can. While Lex was not amused, Tim certainly was, and so were we. Though, considering what they've been through, his tact could use some work. Number 17. A Magical Place – Holes Being stranded out in the middle of nowhere, you've got to do what you can to amuse yourself, even if it's a little cruel. Mr. Sir is constantly getting enjoyment out of crushing the spirits of his exhausted campers, and when they get hopeful upon seeing a storm in the distance, he seizes his opportunity. I got a story for you Girl Scouts. Once upon a time, there was a magical place where it never rained. The end. I don't get it. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> I never get anything he says. Thank goodness none of the campers had to get tucked in by Mr. Sir at night, because his bedtime stories stink. Number 16. Milkman Joke – Big Fish There's something to be said for being able to take what seems like a personal tale and turn it into lowbrow humor. Old Edward recounts a story whereby a prophetic crow would tell him when family members would die the night before in a dream. His dad apparently on the chopping block, the man frets all day for something that never comes, only to get some strange news. You think you've had a bad day, she said. This morning, the milkman dropped dead on the porch. Because, see, my mother was banging the milkman. Can I take your picture? Oh, you don't need a picture. Just look up the word handsome in the dictionary. Please. All right. Milkman will be a staple of dad jokes forever. Number 15. Dashing Appalachian – Inspector Gadget If we're being honest, there's a lot of weird comedy in this film. That said, though, Dr. Claw really should have known better when he hired Andy Dick as a henchman. Upon getting his eponymous apparatus, he uses a word so out there the only real response is a joke. But we still shake our heads at the result. Very diabolical. I deserve a dashing appellation. Dashing appellation? What is that, a hillbilly with a tuxedo? Oh, you idiot! No! <laughs> it's a nickname. One that will send my enemies cowering in fear. Those of you who live in the Appalachians, we apologize on behalf of this movie. Number 14. Woodsman Joke – Hoodwinked We cannot think of a worse time to crack a dad joke than in the middle of a police investigation, even if that investigation centers around fairy tale creatures and woodland critters and whatnot. There are more lumberjack-themed puns than one could shake a stick at, but this one is such easy pickings it might as well have fallen straight out of the tree and conked us on the head. I want to know more about this fellow with the axe. How does he fit into all of this? Maybe you should axe him yourself. <laughs> Is he axe? He got. He was swinging. <laughs> I'll bring him in. Oh my! You're a big fella, aren't you? We get it, Detective Stork. We get it. Number thirteen: Mollusk Joke. Finding Nemo. Look, not all clownfishes are funny, and as long as that harmful stereotype perpetuates, the more we get moments like this. There's a mollusk, see, and, and he walks up to a seat. Well, he doesn't walk up, he swims up. Well, actually, the mollusk isn't moving. He's in one place, and then the sea cucumber, well, they I mixed up. There was a mollusk and a sea cucumber. None of them were walking, so forget that I Sheldon, said Sheldon, get out of Mr. Johansson's yard now! All right, you kid. Ooh, uh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where, where'd you go? Dad, Dad, can I go play too? Can I? I would feel better if you go play over on the sponge beds. <gasps> That's where I would play. 
We felt the cringe so hard when Marlon butchered his joke. It was like watching a slow motion guillotine. Apparently, though, all it takes to get some confidence is an oceanic adventure, because Marlin lands it the next time. So just then, the sea cucumber looks over the mollusk and says, with fronds like these, who needs anemones? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they're laughing is, in actuality, what makes the joke funny for us. Number 12. Standing Army – Duck Soup This classic Marx Brothers comedy is stuffed to the brim with dry, quick-witted humor, but none makes our eyes roll in delight quite like this one. With the nation of Fredonia on the brink of war, Firefly appoints Ciccolini as Secretary of War and immediately picks his brain, leading to this facetious exchange. Now where were we? Oh yes, now that you're Secretary of War, what kind of an army do you think we ought to have? Well, I tell you what I think. I think we should have a standing army. Why should we have a standing army? Because then we save money on chairs. There's plenty of physical comedy in this movie, and no one deserves to be shown the door quite like Ciccolini. Number 11. Drinks on the House – The Muppet Movie Fozzie Bear might be the ultimate teller of dad jokes in movies and TV, but here he might have demonstrated that it's actually his superpower. Let's start things off with a bang! <laughs> Thank you, sir! Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. This guy's lost. Needing to settle an unruly bar turned hostile, he uses his insatiable appetite for booze against them. Though it all goes a little more literally than we originally thought. Okay, everybody, drinks on the house! Drinks on the house! Come on, let's go! Drinks on the house! Drinks on the house! Drinks on the house! Drinks on the house! If we ever get so drunk that we're this gullible, it's probably time to cut us off. Number 10. Timon's Jokes – The Lion King What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? Oh, wow! If you're hungry for a hunk of fat and juicy meat, eat my buddy Bumble here for towards the end of the street. Coming down a dine, on a spacey swine, all you have to do is get in line. Ah, you ain't good. Yup, yup, yup. Oh, some bacon. Yup, yup, yup. Yep, yep. You can be a big thing too. <laughs> when your best friend has little more than fart jokes in his arsenal, your dad jokes probably look pretty good in comparison. Enter Timon, who absolutely will not pass on a good setup. It was genius. Nothing. He's at the top of the food chain. <laughs> <laughs> the food chain! <laughs> Though he's usually the only one laughing at his own jokes, we can't help but laugh ourselves a little at how unfunny the jokes actually are. Kuna Matata? Yeah, it's our motto. What's the motto? Nothing. What's the motto with you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, these two words will solve all your problems. That's right. Take Pumba, for example. Why? When he was a young warthog. When I was a young warthog. Very nice. Thanks. Choice comedy on the planes really dried up when Scar took over, didn't it? Number 9. Top with Hot Fudge. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. The entirety of the sequel to this film was wall-to-wall -wall food puns, but the first one had its moments too. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs sees inventor Flint able to have it rain all kinds of food, from cheeseburgers to pancakes, and yes, spaghetti and meatballs. However, it's the ice cream that's the pièce de résistance, which Flint serves with a joke on top. I don't know how you're gonna top this. Maybe with hot fudge? <laughs> we'll take our ice cream plain, thanks. Number 8. Two Weevils – Master and Commander – The Far Side of the World This one takes a lot of setup. Too much, in fact. But isn't that the cornerstone of dad humor? Captain Aubrey does everything in his power to get Maturin to choose between a pair of weevils that crawl around their food. It doesn't really matter what Maturin says, however, as Aubrey will make the pun either way. There, I have you. You're completely dished. Do you not know that in the service, one must always choose the lesser of two weevils. <laughs> he who would pun would pick a pocket. <laughs> the lesser of two weevils. Silly as the joke is, it actually has some thematic relevance later on, when Aubrey makes a tough decision. That young man was a casualty of war. 
As you said yourself, you have to choose the lesser of two evils. Number seven, the defense rests. North. Movies and TV have made a plethora of jokes at the expense of lawyers, with many calling into question their morals. But here we have the critically panned North to thank for their apparently being bad comedians, too. Come on, Andy, these folks are gonna fight it. Of course they are. They're not gonna take this line down. And then the media circus began. How do you feel about this? Upon learning their son looks to divorce them, two parents both find themselves shocked into a coma. At the subsequent trial, their attorney makes one of the worst jokes we have ever heard. Very good. I've made myself clear to the defense. Your Honor, the defense rests. Then there's nothing left for me to do but make my judgment. And in my judgment, any folks who would sleep through a trial like this are folks who don't deserve to have a wonderful, upstanding son like North. Number six, I'm not wearing any diamonds. Superhero movie. Pretty much everyone knows that movie movies are stupid. In fact, they're pretty stupid on purpose. So we can't say we were shocked when we heard this one. Titanium blades, they cut through diamonds. I'm not wearing any diamonds. <laughs> Honestly, Dragonfly probably could have thought up a diamond-related pun, but instead he dumbs it way, way down. Well, at least he's not the only one with bad jokes, as the villainous Hourglass tags him right back. I wish I could stay longer, Dragonfly, but I just don't have the time. Number 5. Clue Joke, Jumanji. This joke has been uttered so many times, by ourselves included, we're starting to wonder if it was ever funny. Still, if anyone's funny enough to give us the definitive version, it's Robin Williams. Forced to continue playing the titular board game that's worn the team down at every turn, tensions are high. So we can understand Alan's trepidation at taking another dice roll when he makes the obvious joke. I've got it. Colonel Mustard in the library with the wrench. <laughs> Blue. Just roll, Alan. Number four, fun guy, Sonic the Hedgehog. Whenever you make a new friend, at some point that friend is gonna make a really dumb joke. And when that happens, it's your duty as their friend to make them feel really, really stupid. Sonic is feeling down in the dumps, worried he'll have to go back into hiding on the dreadful mushroom planet, to which Tom responds, Well, look at it this way. At least you won't be the only fun guy. No. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> I liked it. Leave the jokes to Sonic, Tom. You're more of the straight man. Number three, subscribers, Yellow Submarine. No, not even rock and roll legends like the Beatles are exempt from making terrible puns. But at least when they do, they acknowledge their blunder. In this animated adventure, the colorful sea vessel finds itself stuck with a dead motor. While the band brainstorms options, Ringo gives us one of the most nail-scratchingly abysmal puns we've ever heard. Well, maybe we should call a road service. Calm, no road. And we're not subscribers. Subscribers. Ooh. You're not going to be anyone's favorite that way, Ringo. Number two, don't call me Shirley. Airplane. One of the best spoof movies of all time, if not the best, Airplane is endlessly quotable. But this running gag might just take the cake. When all the pilots find themselves sick at the mercy of some bad fish, Dr. Rumack asks Ted Stryker, the only passenger with flight experience, if he can land the plane. Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. We're pretty sure that whenever a dad is born, these are his first words. Surely there must be something you can do. I'm doing everything I can. And stop calling me Shirley. Number one, ice puns, Batman and Robin. Are we sure Mr. Freeze's freeze gun doesn't run on the power of dad jokes? What killed the dinosaurs? The ice age! <laughs> Granted, Arnold Schwarzenegger was known for his action movie quips. In fact, his career was practically built off of them. But the decision to make every other line a Batman villain says be ice puns is patently ridiculous. What do you say we heat things up? My passion thaws for my bride alone. Ooh. Talk about your cold shoulder. Though after a while, they start to be the saving grace of an otherwise terrible movie. So maybe we're just being a little cold. All right, everyone. Chill. 
All right, well, that's going to do it for this special salute to dads. Hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo. I'll see you next time. <laughs>